Stanford University. During his doctoral work, he utilized automated olfactory avoidance behavioral training systems and high throughput sequencing to study how memory formation in Drosophilia is regulated via small RNAs. And this work spanned in multiple disciplines, including instrument design and construction, Drosophilia genetics, molecular and computational biology. Prior to his doctoral work, Silas was a member of Richard Axel's lab at Columbia University Medical Center. And um, I think for the sake of the time, the, his great work, I think we should uh, share with the email. Uh, but today we will be hearing uh, about his work at the New York Genome Center about spatial transcriptomics and um, its applications in neuroscience. And with, without further ado, please, uh, you may want to start this. All right, so you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, hello everyone and happy loving day. If you don't know what that day is, I encourage you all to uh, take a look at Google. Um, and I also encourage everybody to work for equality and opportunity in all things we do, particularly professionally. With that said, um, ooh, let's see. I'd like to uh, start off um, with acknowledging the fact that this is uh, what I'm about to talk about is very much a group effort. Um, and uh, much of the talk will be um, centered around uh, work that was uh, conducted by myself uh, and in collaboration with um, Sonia Vikovic, who is now at the Broad, uh, but at the time uh, when much of this work was done, she was at uh, the SciLife Lab in Stockholm. Uh, and Tarmo Ayo, who has since moved on from Flatiron Institute, um, but uh, was there at the time. And in particular, my colleagues at the Center for Genomics of Neurodegenerative Disease, at uh, New York Genome Center and um, our colleagues in the Tech Innovation Lab, uh, also at NYGC. But most importantly, uh, I want to say thank you to um, all of the patients uh, whose uh, financial support this work depends on, and also um, obviously their uh, energy and moral support and encouragement. So thank you all. So uh, the title of the talk is um, related to uh, neurodegeneration, uh, but our group is primarily at this point focused on ALS, although we are expanding uh, into other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so what is ALS? Um, ALS is a fatal uh, neurodegenerative disease um, whose uh, key feature is the loss of upper and lower, lower motor neurons uh, ultimately resulting in paralysis and death. Um, there's no treatment. There are uh, uh, a growing list of causative genes that have been identified, uh, but we still don't really understand the disease that well. Uh, furthermore, we know that the, uh, that the disease involves um, interactions between motor neurons and uh, other cell types, in particular glia. Um, but this isn't particularly well understood. And uh, this uh, fact um, of intercellular interaction being key to the disease uh, is what drove us into uh, you know, um, really uh, pushing on spatially resolved methods. Um, and that's because we felt that spatially resolved methods might allow us to pick apart um, what are the key interactions um, and what are the phenomena um, both in motor neurons themselves and in the other cell types that drive the disease. Um, zooming out a little bit, um, we don't really understand where the disease starts. Is it actually beginning in motor neurons or is it beginning in muscle or is it beginning in glial cell types? And we don't really understand uh, whether it begins at the motor cortex or in the spinal cord um, or simultaneously in both places. Um, and so again, spatially resolved methods um, provide the hope of getting at all these questions. Um, the other great thing about ALS and uh, the spinal cord as a system uh, to develop spatial methods is that uh, the cellular architecture of the spinal cord is highly stereotyped. And so we know where various cell types ought to be. Um, so this work began in the very early uh, days of um, spatially resolved transcriptomics. And uh, we 
didn't really know what to expect out of uh, these type of uh, technologies. And so um, having the toehold of um, prior information uh, just originating from the cellular layout of the spinal cord itself, we felt would be a big help in developing uh, the technologies and the downstream computational tools that we would need to analyze this data. And also, uh, ALS has one of the um, best uh, models of um, neurodegeneration available from the point of view of technology development in that uh, the disease unfolds in these mice in a very highly stereotyped uh, way. And I will uh, return to this in a moment. So how can we uh, generate spatially resolved data um, at sufficient scale to get at a highly heterogeneous uh, disease um, and to uh, get at, you know, to have a substantial enough uh, level of replication to overcome the, you know, life history and uh, other factors that lead to uh, variation between uh, human postmortem samples. Um, well, the answer is uh, a set or a class of technologies that I'll term solid phase capture based uh, spatially encoded RNA seq. Um, the particular flavor we used in our uh, in our large study was uh, called spatial transcriptomics trademark um, by and it was developed in Joachim Lundeberg's group at SciLife Lab, where my colleague Sonia Vikovic was a student at the time. Um, and uh, I'm sure most people on this call already know how the technology works, but just to ensure we have a common foundation, um, essentially one generates a uh, glass slide onto which you've printed uh, spatially barcoded DNA olig uh, oligo capture probes. Each uh, probe has a poly-T tract, so you're uh, capturing via uh, the poly-A tail of, um, of the samples mRNAs. Uh, within each feature, all capture oligos have the all capture probes have the, the same spatial barcode, but each has its own unique molecular identifier. This means that we have a system that ha is spatially resolved and um, that can generate quantitative data, meaning you are able to encode individual capture events and uh, collapse the sequencing data back um, even after all the amplification you have to do in the library prep for this type of technology to get back to these original individual capture events. So you have this glass slide, you section uh, uh, frozen tissue onto it, you do a quick histology stain and image it. This allows you to know how the tissue is positioned with respect to the capture array. You gently permeabilize the tissue, uh, allowing the RNA to diffuse out and hybridize to the capture array. You then do uh, reverse transcription with the tissue sample still in place. And uh, then the molecular details uh, of various technologies sort of di diverge at this point. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, you now have a uh, cDNA library that encapsulates both unique capture events, spatial information, and is uh, covalently linked to the glass slide allowing you to do um, all sorts of nice things like very aggressively remove tissue uh, and get a nice clean library. Uh, and before I move on to the actual study itself, I just wanna point out that this is um, just one of a sort of uh, set of technologies in this area. Uh, 10X has um, commercialized this particular uh, type of technology uh, into their Visium product um, and actually uh, the workflows that were developed in our study um, actually helped them uh, develop their uh, protocols for this too. Um, and we are now generating data with Visium. Um, and the main differences are that uh, in the original uh, technology, the capture features were larger, 100 micron uh, diameter capture features with uh, 200 micron center to center square packed spacing, whereas Visium has uh, 55 micron features with 100 micron center to center hexagonally packed um, array design. Uh, and I'll, I'll point out that this uh, resolution gain fr from ST to Visium is certainly not the end of the road. Uh, Sonia has now gone on to um, 
publish a uh, sort of iteration of this type of technology that uh, has two micron resolution as well. And so it's clear that um, there's sort of, uh, you know, sky's the limit in terms of, um, you know, resolution here. That's an overstatement, but I'd be happy to discuss it later. Um, now to the study itself. So as I mentioned, we uh, utilized this awesome um, mouse model of ALS um, known as the SOD1 G93A uh, model. It, uh, this mouse couples, carries multiple copies of uh, a human uh, ALS causative uh, SOD1 or superoxide dismutase one uh, gene. Um, and we also use equivalent wild type uh, transgenic animal, so multiple insertions of the human wild type uh, gene. Um, but th the use of this model was act was important for us to be able to develop the tools and know that what uh, know that what we were doing was actually valid. Um, but it was all uh, done in the service of getting us to be able to uh, examine human post mortem samples. And I'll get to that at the end. So the SOD1 G93A model um, is awesome because invariably the, the disease uh, begins in uh, the lower limbs or the hind limbs. Um, and the animal will, will reach uh, phenotypic um, hallmarks within a couple of days across all, essentially all individuals. So these uh, time points are, are um, very stereotyped and so we had some idea of what to expect at each time point. So we picked time points that would be um, well on one side or the other of um, molecular events that we um, you know we knew to we could anticipate. So for instance there are molecular changes uh, underway at p50 um, that we can observe by immunofluorescence but if you take a given any random tissue section, you may not observe those changes in every tissue section. Whereas at P70, almost every tissue section uh, will have those, um, those changes evident. So uh, hence we picked these time points. Um, and I will say that uh, at P120, this is end stage, these animals are so sick, they can't even write themselves and they can't feed and have to be euthanized. So it's a rapidly progressing uh, model too, which obviously is, is useful as well. So the first thing we did, um, as I say, just to remind you, this was um, you know, early days. We got our hands on the technology through uh, collaboration with, um, with the Lundeberg lab very early on. And we wanted to sort of know what uh, we were doing made sense. Uh, and also the Lundeberg lab had developed this assay to determine what the lateral diffusion distance was uh, on um, any given sample. So what one does is the exact same workflow that is used in the actual uh, spatial transcriptomics uh, you know, library generating uh, protocol, but instead of using a, uh, a slide that has um, discrete barcoded features, one uses a slide that just has an even lawn of poly T. So uh, one permeabilizes the tissue um, and does the uh, reverse transcription just as one would do in a full up uh, ST experiment. But uh, you add a Psi3 labeled uh, DCTP into the reverse transcri transcription mix. And the re this results in essentially a, CDNA, a fluorescent cDNA print of the tissue being profiled. And I hope these two images of the same tissue section convince you that this technology works quite well. And when one has optimized the, uh, the permeabilization uh, conditions, one is able to resolve fine features quite well. So you can see, uh, I, I, can, you, can you see my pointer here? I hope you can. Um, yes. Okay, great. So one can see fine features here. One can even see this axon hillock on this motor neuron here. And uh, I think I skipped over it and I will just say that this structure here or here is known as the ventral horn. This is where motor neurons, these very large uh, neurons uh, reside. They are cholinergic and um, uh, that may come into play later in the talk. These are some of the largest cells in the body, right, with a meter long axon. Um, and uh, they are also, their soma are, are uh, somata are uh, very large as well. 
So uh, in a little greater detail, the ST technology um, looks like this when it's in use. So you have a thousand barcoded features, um, and this is actually an image um, acquired after the experiment is over of the array itself used to profile these four mouse lumbar spinal cord tissue sections. And uh, here on the lower left, what you see is a sort of diagrammatic view of what these, what 100 micron capture uh, features look like in the context of the mouse lumbar spinal cord. Um, and what you see here is that uh, you have a great deal of heterogeneity of the content captured within each spot uh, based on just where the spot falls on the tissue. Um, so in this case, you have uh, three uh, alpha motor neurons, those that are most uh, motor, uh, vulnerable to the disease, and a gamma motor neuron, uh, a type of motor neuron that is more resistant. Here you have uh, neuropil, here you have a single gamma, and so on and so forth. And so one expects that there is going to be a great deal of heterogeneity in the signal observed uh, in uh, any um, given spot. And this leads me to the computational challenges uh, involved in such a study. So solid phase capture-based uh, uh, RNA-seq, or spatially resolved RNA-seq, um, can generate an enormous amount of data very quickly if you have the money or an awesome collaboration with the Lundeberg lab that gives you um, arrays at no cost. <laughs> um, so we generated uh, data from about 1,200 mouse tissue sections. Um, so this uh, resulted in about uh, 76,000 spatial gene expression measurements or spots um, for our mouse data, and we profiled 80 human tissue sections um, or about 60,000 uh, SGEMs there. Um, we have almost 70 animals, four time points, three genotypes, um, and then we have the human data as well as you see here. And so um, dealing with this type of data um, is daunting. Um, and uh, we continue to, to work on comp computational techniques for this type of data. Much like single cell data, uh, it has um, a great deal of vari variability in observation, some of which is uh, biologically based and some of which is technically based. And um, I know that in some camps, zero inflation is um, not the favorite term, term anymore, but there is sparsity of data. So um, the, the first thing that we did was sort of uh, to try to come up with a, a conception of how we might even be able to make the type of comparisons that we wanted to make. So for instance, we knew that we would want to be able to compare spots that map to the ventral horn across genotypes within a time point. But we might also want to be able to make comparisons between the ventral horn, uh, an area where motor neurons are lost, and the dorsal horn, an area containing um, interneurons that is largely unaffected by the disease um, within a single uh, tissue section. So how would we do that? Well, um, by brute force. And so this is where I say this was a, um, a team effort uh, in the truest sense from my colleagues at CGND. Um, we manually annotated all of our 130,000 uh, measurements used in this study with an anatomical annotation region tag um, that would allow us to make these type of uh, uh, comparisons. And we built, this is just a screenshot from a tool we built to do this. Now 10X's Space Ranger tool does this type of thing. But the other thing that this uh, annotation allowed us to do was something pretty cool that Tarmo came up with. And it, it's amazing how well it works. So what we can do is just find the centroids of the um, of the areas that are that contain ventral horn or dorsal horn uh, AAR tags, and since we know that the two ventral horns ought to be um, sort of uh, parallel with each other, and uh, similarly the dorsal horn, and that the dorsal horn should always be above the ventral horn, we can do a very simple registration operation in which we just basically line them up on the basis of these four centroids. And when we do this, it works extremely well. So you can see here, this is all um, 70 some thousand um, of our uh, mouse um, SGEMs. And you can see that their AAR tags um, map um, very nicely with this simple registration technique. 
But more importantly, the biology makes sense. So we know that in the periphery of the spinal cord, uh, we expect to see um, markers of myelin because this is the major uh, white matter. These are ascending and descending axonal tracts. Um, and the gray matter in the uh, ventral horn ought to be enriched for cholinergic genes of which SLC5A7 is one. And the gray matter generally should be enriched for synaptic markers such as SNAP25. And lastly, I'll just point out that um, when we register our data in this way, we are able to overcome the sparsity of spatial sampling in the, uh, that this type of technology generates um, through replication and end up sampling the spinal cord actually quite densely and evenly. Um, so how do we use this? Uh, we developed a computational method uh, called splotch. Um, and I won't dwell on this too much, um, but basically what it incorporates is a, a linear model that sort of has everything we know about um, in a, a given uh, a sample, a given tissue section, um, and right, so it has uh, all the sort of metadata attached to it. It has a spatial autocorrelation component um, that uses, uh, that shares information in the local neighborhood within a section. And then it has an additional component that uh, takes into account um, the uh, sort of other sources of um, spot level variation. And uh, this technique allows us to reliably analyze um, on the order of uh, you know, 11, 12,000 genes per spot, uh, even though each spot might only capture uh, 1,100 genes. And I just want to make clear here that across the whole array, we'll see all of those 11 or 12,000 genes. It's just on a given spot, we'll only see like 1,100. And through the splotch model, we are able to uh, infer the expression of genes that might not be observed. So what does splotch uh, give us as a view of the disease? So a component of ALS is progressive reactive gliosis involving um, both astrocytes and microglia. GFAP or glial fibrillary acidic protein is a, uh, is a astrocytic uh, gene or astrocyte express gene and is known to be uh, highly upregulated in the spinal cord um, at end stage. And what our spatial analysis allows us uh, to see is that um, this uh, dysregulation of GFAP really does seem to originate in the vicinity of um, the ventral horn where the motor neurons are. Um, and also we're able to sort of uh, delineate the behaviors of various genes um, expressed by the same cell type. So ALDH1L1 is another astrocyte expressed gene. And you can see the spatial patterns and even the uh, temporal dynamics are di distinct between GFAP and um, ALDH1L1. Um, splotch also gives us uh, a nice way to do um, differential expression analysis. Uh, and, uh, and what you see here is, is the, um, the coefficient beta, which essentially is our, um, our call of expression level with a probability for a given gene in a given condition. And so here you have um, the ALS model um, in red and the wild type in blue, and you can see that uh, GFA, GFAP expression is um, significantly differentially expressed uh, in the G93A animals from uh, the wild type very early, this is pre-symptomatically, um, and that this just continues to escalate. Whereas other areas of the uh, spinal cord, this uh, um, differential expression does not become significant until later in the disease. And just for context, this is an invariant gene here, so you can see what that looks like. And I should point out that these uh, plots are um, the output of a uh, web-based tool that we have uh, made available at als-st.mygenome.org. Um, and so you can explore our full data there. Um, similarly, we can delineate uh, between um, what we believe are subpopulations of, of uh, microglia across the uh, time course. So FCRLS is, um, expressed by uh, phagocytic um, reactive microglia, whereas SAL1 and TMEM119 are expressed by 
uh, homeostatic microglia. And so uh, you can see here that we are actually seeing uh, differences in the spatio-temporal uh, dynamics of these, um, of these microglial subpopulations, or at least that's what we interpret this result to mean. So this is great. We can do uh, differential expression analysis and we have some idea of where to look to see these changes. Uh, but what does this actually look like when we use another modality to validate? And so we, we uh, validated all of our results with immunofluorescence. And what we can see here is that um, this uh, microglial activation uh, axis, including the genes TyroBP or DAP12, and TREM2 is, acti is uh, activated very early, and that this activation occurs in the ventral lateral white matter and ventral horns. And so when we look by immunofluorescence, this is exactly what we see. So this is very reassuring. Now this is great to have a gene by gene view. Um, oh, and I will just say that um, when we look uh, at not just um, genes expressed by one cell type, but genes expressed by uh, multiple cell types, we can really start to see the power of this system um, for untangling how these interactions might be important for the disease. So in this view, we see CHAT, choline acetyltransferase, which is expressed by motor neurons here in, in magenta, and TyroBP or DAP12 um, expressed in microglia in green. And what we can see here is that very early on, so before any symptoms have appeared, we see this activation axis um, coming up in the ventral lateral white matter. And interestingly, when we look at higher magnification, we can see that these microglia seem to be uh, associated primarily with these cholinergic axon tracts. So this is very exciting for us that it directly implicates an interaction of the uh, motor neuron and glial cells early on as something that is dysregulated. Uh, and this is just um, exp expounding on that point, so I won't dwell here. So, as I've said, this is good for getting at gene by gene observations, but what we'd like to have is a more sort of systems view of what's going on here. So what we did um, is we just took all of the observations in our mouse data set, and we sort of uh, threw out the, the metadata for these purposes um, and just considered how well correlated the expression of any, two, um, of any gene pair uh, is across all the spots from all conditions in our data set. Um, this generates, so this is just simple bi-clustering. Um, and when we do this, uh, we can arbitrarily set a break in the dendrogram and consider everything that falls uh, below the uh, break in the same uh, branch to be uh, an expression module. And when we do this, um, it was actually quite encouraging just looking at the sets of genes that uh, sort of group together. So this uh, expression module number eight was filled with uh, reactive microglial and reactive astrocytic uh, expressed genes, whereas this expression module 11 was much smaller, but uh, exclusively contains genes expressed by uh, cholinergic neurons, um, and almost all of these genes have a gene ontology annotation of uh, ALS. So that's very encouraging, but we wanted to see what these modules look like in um, spatial context, um, or I should say spatiotemporal genetic context. And so uh, what we did um, is that we standardized the expression, or aka normalized the expression, uh, of all the genes within a given module took the average expression, the average uh, of that standardized expression, and then assigned it for each spot, and then assigned that value back to the spatio-temporal genetic coordinate from which it was derived. And when we do this, we can see very clearly that, uh, that this is telling us something meaningful about biology. So this module eight that I told you uh, captures this uh, reactive gliosis, um, clearly shows this um, as the, the uh, time course um, proceeds. And this module 11 that is uh, motor neuron uh, expressed clearly shows the progressive loss of motor neurons as the disease proceeds. So this is very, very reassuring. Um, and we conceive of these expression modules because the resolution of the technology uh, means 
necessarily that you will be capturing a signal from multiple cells of various cell types together in every observation. We, we conceive of these expression modules to reflect activities that are coordinated across cell types. Um, right. But we wanted to get at um, what was going on within individual cell types. Oh, and this is just to show you that, you know, uh, we can look at other uh, expression modules and they too have very nice uh, uh, spatiotemporal dynamics as well. So uh, I told you that the, uh, this dorsal horn area is largely unaffected and you can see that this uh, expression module captures this nicely. So we wanted to get at what was going on within each uh, cell type uh, that is contributing to these expression modules. So what we did is we took uh, external single cell and single nuclear data. So we've used, uh, I think, four data sets at this point to um, try this procedure on. And you know, there's differences uh, in what you get um, out of using various different um, external data sources. But um, you know, this has as much to do with the way people annotate their um, clusters um, in a TSNI or whatever, um, as it does um, you know, any real differences in um, in the biology, I would say. Uh, but anyway, uh, what we did is we took each of our expression modules and we re-clustered the genes within them on the basis of how characteristic their expression was of any given cell type in the external single cell or single nuclear data. And when we do this, uh, we can see that we are now um, able to resolve sub modules, expression submodules that seem to be biologically coherent. So for instance, this, uh, this submodule is very clearly a microglial uh, submodule. The genes are, in it are expressed almost exclusively within microglia. Um, and moreover, they all seem to be uh, related to this uh, phagocytic activity. So in this same top level expression module is another submodule of astrocytes. So there are several astrocyte cell types here, and that's why this um, submodule is spread across several columns here, but these are all astrocytes. So what you can see here is a number of other factors that we also know are involved in um, glial activation, so APOE, for instance, um, and GFAP. But then interestingly, we have this other um, submodule that is microglia enriched, but also in, it contains genes that are expressed by other cell types. And this is um, enriched in, this submodule is enriched in factors involved in uh, lipid mediated signaling. So uh, we conceive of these submodules as the coordinated activities within cell type. And we can do gene ontology analysis, keg analysis, all this um, on it, and, and really start to uh, zero in on um, pathways of interest. So one pathway that um, was of particular interest was autophagy. So um, our group helped con contribute to the identification of TBK1 as a uh, ALS causative um, gene. And uh, this sort of, uh, started a bunch of people thinking about how autophagy might be related to, um, to motor neuron loss in, in ALS. And uh, so um, just as we were starting to get this work going, a paper was published showing that if you knock out ATG7, which is a factor absolutely required for autophagy, uh, you get, uh, and if you do this specifically in, um, in cholinergic cells, that you get a dramatic change in phenotype in these SOD1 G93A animals. Interestingly, the animals develop a motor phenotype earlier, so they have a tremor earlier, uh, but they live almost 20% longer than um, animals without this manipulation. So this sort of indicates that autophagy is playing a very complex role here at very, and that the role it plays may be in fact different at various stages of the disease. So we wanted to investigate this further. So we, um, we use these same animals. So it's an ATG7 conditional uh, uh, knockout in 
um, cholinergic cells. And what you can see here is, um, this is from that same paper, that when you do this manipulation, you have a dramatic attenuation of gliosis. So remember, this is just a manipulation in, in uh, motor neurons, but you can see here EBA1, which is expressed in microglia, is dramatically downregulated in the um, conditional knockout. And we see this as well in our ST data. So you can see here that this gliosis is greatly attenuated. So this is very interesting, uh, directly implicating autophagy in the non-cell autonomous um, uh, mechanisms that lead to motor neuron loss. Um, and so when we, when we do this uh, co-expression analysis and um, you know, identify submodules, we can actually sort of parse different subpopulations of um, various cell types. So in this instance, we can um, see two different uh, subpopulations of microglia that seem to have very different spatiotemporal dynamics, um, both in the wild type and of course in the disease, but also with uh, respect to their response to the conditional knockout. Similarly, uh, we can do this with astrocytes. And so this uh, sort of is illustrative of the way that one could design a study um, to really get at uh, very complex intracellular signaling activities, even when one doesn't have uh, single cell resolution in these spatial technologies. So at the beginning, I said this is all uh, devoted towards um, understanding the disease in, in humans. And so with all the results I just showed you in hand, we were very confident that we had a system and downstream computational methods that would allow us to understand the disease. And so uh, we applied it to human postmortem tissue, which for those of you who have worked with it, um, you'll know that it is um, vastly more challenging to work with. Um, I mean, we have, these are not syngenic animals. These are not um, even um, samples that have been handled in the same way. There's differing postmortem interval, different freezing techniques, and so on and so forth. Yet, um, when we started to generate this data, it actually still looked quite good. So, what did we do? Well, I, we have the problem in postmortem samples that you know, one can't remove a piece of the spinal cord to profile it from a human. Obviously, that's a lethal uh, intervention. And so um, we're dependent on seeing um, the sort of aftermath of the car wreck, right? Um, we're um, ne necessarily going to be examining um, tissue that is, uh, in many cases, devoid of motor neurons um, and full of reactive gliosis or glial scars. So how do we get at this? Well, um, one of the things that the NYGC ALS consortium has been meticulous in is collecting uh, clinical data in a uniform way. And so we have uh, all sorts of information, you know, everything from was the individual a smoker, what's their genotype, um, you know, uh, at what age did the disease begin, and uh, where in the body did the disease begin, uh, importantly. So we, we thought that if we have patients that had lower limb onset, so the symptoms first appeared in their legs, uh, they, spinal cord locations innervating uh, that part of the body would probably be more uh, severely affected than parts of the spinal cord that are more distant. So those in, innervating you know, the um, cervical area of the, the body. So, uh, similarly, uh, patients that might have had bulbar or sort of uh, 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 facial muscle and uh, orofacial muscle um, symptom onset would uh, probably have a more affected cervical sample than a lumbar side sample. And so we took samples from both locations uh, from every individual and we looked for, um, you know, differences that were, um, you know, that varied uh, with respect to um, distance to site of symptom onset in the spinal cord. And the punchline of this is that the variability of uh, human postmortem samples is such that we couldn't, could not do the, um, the uh, differential expression analysis that we did on the mice, but we could uh, 
certainly to the co-expression analysis and our modules um, display uh, characteristic spatial um, expression and also uh, there are modules that vary with regard to proximity to the symptom onset. And so we're now expanding greatly on this sample number and hope to be able to do the same type of analysis that we did on our mice. So I'll just skip through this quickly. So I hope I've convinced you that we have a nicely working ST workflows. We have a way to analyze them and that we've actually learned something from, about the disease this way. Um, but where do we go from here? So first of all, we wanna utilize the data that we've already generated uh, more deeply. So we've re-annotated all of our mouse data. Um, so all of the ventral horn spots that contain motor neurons have been annotated as such uh, versus those that don't. And we're now doing differential expression analysis in a way that we're trying to actually zero in on changes that are very specific to, um, to the motor neurons themselves. We've also used these annotations to train an uh, uh, automated um, annotation tool that's about 80% effective on the mouse spinal cord. So that's quite nice. Um, but we'd also like to generate new data. So it's nice to be able to profile gene expression, but ultimately uh, we wanna know what's going on at the protein level as well, especially since ALS is known to involve the protein apathies, uh, in, in particular uh, um, the generation of intracellular TDP, phospho-TDP43 uh, inclusions. Um, and these inclusions can occur in various cell types uh, and in various sort of uh, morphologies. And how these uh, various um, phospho CDP43 inclusions and other proteinopathies relate to um, you know, changes at the RNA level and actual disease outcome is not well understood. And so in this image, what you can see here is that you know, uh, sort of three very uh, different um, phospho TDP43 pathologies. And I, I wanna point out here that there seems to be sort of attended differences in the glial uh, community around each of these as well. And so we'd like to understand that. So how are we going about that? Well, we're going to sort of generate uh, multi-omic sandwiches. So what we are doing is um, generating um, spatial transcriptomics in green, uh, pro highly multiplex immunofluorescence imaging in red, and then uh, imaging-based transcriptomic data uh, in blue here from both the uh, motor cortex and the lumbar spinal cord in human samples. And we know that this type of approach is uh, valid because our, our colleagues in the Lundeberg and Distruper lab have demonstrated this on a paper that's, been, that's on bioarchive in an uh, AD mouse model, and it works quite nicely. So I said we were generating um, highly multiplex immunofluorescence data, and we're doing this using a technology developed in, uh, in the Pelkman's lab called uh, iterative indirect immu uh, in immunofluorescence imaging. Um, and this technique, uh, without diving into it too deeply, allows one to do dozens of uh, protein stains on the same sample. They demonstrated it in cells, um, and I won't go into the technical details here for the sake of time, uh, but Joanna Petrescu in our group has modified their technique to, um, to work on uh, tissue sections and uh, we're now generating uh, these multiomic uh, um, tissue section stacks. And what I'm showing you here is a single mouse lumbar spinal cord section that's been stained uh, for uh, whatever it is, eight factors, but we've done this for many more. Um, and it works quite nicely. And we can register the data to our spatial transcriptomics. Uh, and now we can sort of uh, relate the pathologies that we can resolve through 4i to the transcriptomic signatures that we re resolve through ST. Um, and I just want to sort of zip through this quickly. Um, and this is just to show that we can do it on, on human uh, set samples as well, which is very much more challenging. Um, and that we, even though we're using fresh frozen as opposed to cryopreserved samples, uh, we were still able to resolve, resolve fine detail here as is illustrated by um, our ability, even with just a uh, 10X error objective to resolve these fine um, cellular features of you know, uh, axons in this case. 
So it's great to be able to do that, but we wanted to automate this. Um, and so we've put a great deal of effort into actually sort of engineering systems to be able to do this. And uh, Joanna again came up with uh, a really clever solution here. So we were trying to laser cut gaskets with uh, uh, to build a flow cell. And we're finding that the laser was actually sintering the um, sort of gasket that we were cutting and causing improper seals. So she found a $250 instrument called a cricket, which is meant for um, craft quilters. And we're now using this to cut this uh, polyamide, uh, polyamide tape. Uh, it's called Kapton. It's the material that you wrap spacecraft in to protect them from uh, you know, um, so, uh, radiation-induced heat changes. So it's highly stable. It's adhesive coated on both sides. And uh, what this uh, flow cell should show you is how robust this is because uh, we messed up the um, software a little bit and actually pumped into it when it, the valve was closed and actually blew the back out of this flow cell here because it was so well sealed with the gasket. So this is qu working quite nicely. And here's just sort of a schematic of how we put it together. So we have a regular microscope slide onto which we section our, our tissue. We have the polyamide uh, film, and then we have a cover glass that we image through. Um, we have this on our confocal, but we're not really an imaging powerhouse. So, um, but we are a sequencing powerhouse. And as many of you know, the high seq 2500 is no longer going to be supported by Illumina in just, um, I think like a year or two. And we have a lot of these sitting around because we have Nova seeks. And for those of you that don't know, a high seq 2500 is actually quite a nice little uh, microscope with um, attended uh, fluidic handling. I don't uh, have time to go through this too much, but it does incorporate this nice time delay integration camera, which allows for uh, very high signal to noise uh, acquisition. Um, and so this is quite a nice system. Uh, but most importantly, it has a lot of reagent ports. It has temperature control of the reagents. And so we've, uh, along with uh, Kunal Pandit from the Innovation Lab at uh, NYGC, have developed this flow cell and um, a set of uh, uh, Python code that allows one to control the, um, the HiSeq 2500 as an imaging system. And this is on GitHub. And I say that uh, this is nice for us because we have this very large, very high throughput study um, underway, and we need a lot of imaging systems to get through all of the 4i imaging. And so we have all of these high seeks. And um, for those of you starting up your own labs, I think you can still get a high seek for less than $10,000 now, whereas these are million dollar instruments just a few years ago. And I'll just conclude here, um, sort of giving you the takeaway from all of this, which is that um, we aim to build a multi-scale, multimodal uh, data set that um, really allows us to interrogate how uh, known pathology relates to um, the genotype of the sample, how, uh, of the, uh, how the disease unfolds, and what are the key intercellular and cell autonomous um, uh, activities that drive all of this. So with all of that, I'd just like to thank the organizers and um, open it up to any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Slas, for this great presentation. Very much multi-scale, really. <laughs> From images to all the sequences, with a lot of data. And we have a few questions actually on the chat channel. Would you like to read or? Uh, yes, just give me a second to pull it up. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, the first one is from Krishna. Does this web interface have information on human ALS patient gene expression in a temporal manner? No, it doesn't because, uh, as I said, we're not able to look um, you know, at anything other than uh, end stage or post-mortem in, in humans. Although we, we are now uh, beginning to work with um, uh, collaborators at University of Edinburgh, um, where the UK Brain Bank is based and um, and they have a substantial number of um, sudden death controls that are better age matched. And at some point, uh, perhaps we'll have some sudden death ALS patients. But please remember that ALS is a rare disease. And so um, the probability of just getting any sample, let alone the exact sample you want is very low in the first place. 
right? And then uh, Krishna has a second question, which is, what is your thought on why ablation of neuronal autophagy reduced gliosis? Um, so <laughs> there is, um, this is a complex uh, answer and perhaps beyond the scope of this. I'd be happy to, to talk about it at greater length, but it turns out that for instance, TBK1 actually sits at the sort of nexus of autophagy and innate immunity. Interferon signaling seems to be important in um, the recruitment of uh, neurotoxic cells and neurotoxic activities from those cells. Um, but there is also a whole um, area of interest in the ALS field in exosomes and how improper recycling of um, things through the uh, uh, you know, endolysosomal uh, pathway might um, result in, uh, in uh, secretion of factors that you know, induce this uh, neurotoxic activity. Um, and I think that's it in the chat, unless I'm missing something. Yeah, I think that's it for now um, in the chat, but I think people may be adding. And quick question for uh, the spatial maps from mice and in comparison to human specimens. And is there any um, specific differences that you notice uh, globally in terms of mice to human differences? Like, can you comment on that? Um, so, uh, of course, I don't think I have the slide here readily available. Um, perhaps mm -hmm. I do. Yep. Okay. So we actually looked at, uh, how, um, you know, whether there was concordance between the mouse and human data. And so what you're looking at here is, um, how, uh, how well, yeah, how, how concordant, um, the contents of the, uh, of the, um, expression modules are in both the mouse and human data. And you can see that obviously there's a great deal of difference, um, but there is substantial um, overlap. And so we are, we hope with our expanded human data set, uh, going to be able to um, find more of this similarity and to better model uh, things that we see in the human from mouse. So certainly there's a large amount of overlap, um, you know, but uh, of the things that came out of this, of our initial analysis, most of it was expected. However, this lipid signaling thing really sticks out in our, in our analysis in a way that it didn't in, um, it hasn't in the literature um, in the same way. Uh, but our, our, that's not to say that others have not also identified this lipid mediated signaling, because uh, they have. Um, it just, this really um, seems to be an interesting um, uh, mechanism that's dysregulated in the disease. Cool. Interesting. And uh, as we wait for maybe another question, I have another one. Um, so for now that you are doing 4i, that's a protein map. And most of the other, you know, teams, for instance, they're using the gene expression maps, right? So what do you think the future will be for proteomics and disease studies uh, for spatial mapping? Do you think will that be more functionally relevant or? What yeah, I'm very excited. I think, yes, it will be more functionally re relevant. So something I didn't mention is that we also did a, a, a little pilot data generation exercise in which um, we generated on alternating, al alternating tissue sections, ST data, and then imaging mass spec data. Um, and this was proof of concept. And I, I don't know if you guys see my Zoom window here because it's hiding things, but um, what you can see here in our mass spec data is very clearly there's difference between the control and the mutant um, for certain peaks, but we did not do the proteomics to identify what those peaks were. And uh, we hope to um, be able to do that. So all of that said, this is sort of a more exotic technology and things like immunosaver are very appealing um, as we saw last week. Um, but for now, uh, you know, we're sort of trying to go through these um, with, low-hanging fruit in, and cheapness in mind. Uh, we are not vastly funded. We are not an imaging powerhouse. Um, and so the 4i technology ported onto the HiSeq really seems to be a, a clear way forward for us. We don't have to make a major investment up front in DNA barcoded antibodies, and we have an imaging system that can do it at high throughput at the resolutions that we need. However, it would be really nice, for instance, to do metabolomics spatially resolved via imaging mass spec and really get at this lipid-mediated signaling. 
consciousness. And uh, as we, anybody else asking? Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, this is incredible work. Uh, congratulations. I have uh, probably two to three uh, questions uh, if time allows. Uh, so I, I think when I look at your um, sort of astrocyte pattern and oligodendrocyte pattern, seems like astrocyte activation correlates very nicely with micro, uh, microgliosis and uh, uh, but oligodendrocyte seems like opposite. So, so I wonder if you have any kind of interpretation there. And uh, 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 it is possible, I think astrocyte activation plays a role in a uh, sort of in local inflammation and a, uh, sort of neuronal damage as well. Yeah, yeah so um, it's really, so this, I spent several months just sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> diving through this data and this um, this submodule analysis when we first um, had it uh, in hand, um, and one of the things you do see in some of these um, expression modules, and of course I don't have the figure here, that sort of have this uh, module eight like um, pattern, but aren't in fact module eight. So uh, in some of these other modules, you see. Uh, overrepresentation of genes that are um, expressed in oligodendrocyte precursors. And so this um, jives with what, what we already know from other people's work at the disease. So you have uh, defects in myelination, an attempt to remyelinate, but the myelin never really matures uh, in the way that um, you know would occur normally. So you have uh, increasing oligodendrocyte precursor representation and decreasing uh, uh, mature myelin uh, representation in the data, and so that is associated um, with other uh, with other factors. And I should say that this uh, module one here, that is oligodendrocyte enriched, also has Sal one in it. So it has a a um, a homeostatic um, microglial um, you know expression program included in it as well. So it's a, it's a, good, op, it's a good observation on your part um, that these two things do seem to be related. Uh, <clears throat> so I wonder if you uh, ever look at sort of, the, sort of the, the different cell types within different modules, how they interact, for example, like a ligand receptor interaction. I'm just very curious how the kind of microglia astrocyte activation might trigger uh, regional inflammation and how that signal uh, eventually damage the neurons. So we have not gone through the data sufficiently to get at that type of the question because we, we with this data in hand, we knew we had something and we are now on to data generation for the human. It's obviously something we want to do. Um, and there are actually is, I, I can't remember the, uh, the details of it, but I just saw recently a, a bioarchive uh, uh, preprint um, with a computational technique for doing exactly this, looking at um, you know ligand receptor interactions and downstream signaling. And that would be a great thing to do with this if we had um, somebody interested and funded to do it. <laughs> All right, uh, if time allows, I just uh, uh, very curious about, um, uh, uh, so, so if I, I, I knew some patients, actually AOS, uh, they gradually develop the motor neuron uh, dysfunction, but very asymmetric. So either kind of left leg or right leg. Uh, yeah, so uh, in your data, I wonder, or in your mouse model, if you've ever seen that sort of the, the sort of the symptom started and uh, just uh, one side of the body and uh, whether or not that correlates with the, the spinal cord neuron degeneration also asymmetric. So in the SOD model, the model is so aggressive that you're not going to see that. Um, it basically mm -hmm. um, unfolds so quickly, it, it's not really possible to capture. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we hope that to be able to see that type of thing in the human data, and our, our human clinical data is fine-grained enough to say which limb it, it began on. Um, then there's sort of the technical trickiness of knowing which side is up on the spinal cord sample that you get and being able to say which side is right or left. But one would presumably be able to say if there was a sort of um, unilateral 
um, you know, impact or more severe uh, impact on one side of the body, uh, presumably you would be able to see that um, discordance across, um, you know, one side or the other, the spinal cord. But uh, it's something we just haven't had the replication to be able to look at yet. But hopefully, give us a few months and I'll be able to um, have a different story to tell you about that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, Thanks. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to part ways with this because I actually have another uh, uh, call to discuss um, this work and uh, that's already underway. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Amenietas. And I think we were happy to have you here today. And then next week, I think we have on the schedule, uh, let me double check. Next week, we have Dr. Uh, Joshua Weinstein from University of Chicago. And he's going to be talking about DNA microscopy work that he did, especially at Broad, Broad Institute earlier and now in his lab at the University of Chicago. And we hope to see you next week. And thank you again. Thank you very much again. Thank you.